Welcome, everyone, to Fucking Capitalism, the series presented by My Sex Bio. Fucking Capitalism takes a look at uh, the relationship between political economy and sexuality. Don't worry, we'll talk about what political economy is. And just a disclaimer for myself, I'm Pierce Delahunt. Um, I hold a variety of positions of power and privilege, including in this conversation, the being the facilitator, which I think doesn't often get named enough. But uh, I am not profiting off of uh, these classes. Proceeds go to my sex bio and their other staff. Please do check out their other material. It's really awesome. And I'll let people know where some other things uh, later on where they can find us too. And this every month is a new theme. And this theme is my sex bios theme is group sex. And from that, we're going into uh, natural selection and collective action. So we'll, we'll dive into what, what all those are. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll get the shared screen going and I'll, uh, I'll show you what's, what's going on here. Great. So I'm presuming everyone can see okay. And what we're doing is we're starting out by looking at political economy. All that means is that it's just a combination of politics and economics. And all too often, especially in the United States, the ideas of politics and economics are uh, seen as separate things. But the field of political economy says that there is no separating them. You can't have a political system that is not firmly embedded in an economic system, and you can't have an economic system that is not firmly embedded in a political system. One just real obvious, straightforward example of that is that a relationship between an employer and an employee is always based on a contract. And when there is a violation of that contract, then either person can call on the state to help enforce that contract. And depending on what kind of political economy you are in, that state will have a friendlier relationship to either the employer or the employee. And that brings us to what kinds of political economy are there. there the two big ones are socialism and capitalism. Socialism being when the workers control and capitalism being when the owners control. I want to emphasize here that socialism is not just anything the government does. There's a lot of things the government does that socialists do not like. Capitalism is not anything that businesses do. There's a, a lot of things businesses do that, that capitalists don't like or pro-capitalists don't like anyway, and we'll get into that. But, um, but you can have a socialist business and you can have a capitalist government. In fact, here in the United States, we do. What determines whether it is socialism or capitalism is who is in control, who has power, and that is workers versus owners. And what are they controlling? It's always a tug of war over the means of production. That's key. What are means of production? Examples include land, education, materials, bodies, labor, a key one, et cetera. But it's all in the phrase itself. The means of production are any of the means used to produce something, uh, goods or services in the, the economic system. So land and the actual materials or tools or, or factories those are all really classical examples. But the big one that we're focusing on for this purpose right here is labor, because labor is what determines whether you're a worker or an owner. Owners, they own the means of production. And so then they rent out, they rent the labor from the workers to work the means of production so that the capitalists can then turn a profit. The workers, on the other hand, they don't own the means of production. So what they have to do then is they have to rent out their own labor. And that's how they get the wages from the capitalists. And that's what makes someone a capitalist. We are not capitalists just because we support capitalism. We're only capitalists if we actually own the means of production and if we hire workers and then profit off of their labor. So you have the workers or the proletariat and you have the owners or the bourgeoisie or the capitalists. So it's working class, owning class. There's a lot of different uh, ways that that can be described, but that's the idea. Of course, it's not a binary. It's not a. It's not an obvious line uh, where you cross over from worker to capitalist necessarily. There are gray areas and edge cases, just like there are gray areas and edge cases and edge cases with socialism and capitalism. But it's all about that tension, uh, and that's where 
how how things play out and and how uh, the tensions try to resolve themselves. That's the that play out of the tug of war. To clarify that example of what a means of production is, there's a difference between personal property and private property. So the house that you live in and personally use, that's your personal property, that's not a means of production. The house that you rent out to someone else, you yourself are not using, but you are profiting off of it. That is a means of production to you, to be clear. So when you hear socialists talking about seizing the means of production, they're not talking about seizing your house or your toothbrush, or your laptop, or your phone. They're talking about only the things that capitalists profit from. And then one thing I want to clarify here too, uh, as per the conversation here at My Sex Bio, is the distinction between capitalist feminism and socialist feminism. So capitalist feminism says that in order to achieve feminism or gender equality, we have to give everyone an equal opportunity to climb the corporate ladder, and then after that, if you're poor, it's your own fault. And we, we don't, we're no longer responsible for trying to help overcome any injustice because there is no injustice because you had the opportunity to climb the corporate ladder and you didn't. Socialist feminism, on the other hand, says that's not enough. Not only will poverty always disproportionately affect women and uh, queer and trans folk, but even just a white heterosis man dying of poverty is not particularly feminist either. And in order to abolish poverty, we have to abolish private property, and that means abolishing capitalism. And, and I do want to name too in that, that it is both things are true that uh, marginalized people, including black folk and women, have more of a tendency to to distribute the goods that they accumulate to their communities to to look out for each other than has been the case with capitalism in general and it is also true that black capitalism and female based capitalism are not going to save black people and are not, is not going to save women just the same way that this capitalism dominated by white heterosis men has not saved all white heterosis men so both of those things are true. Cool. So that's the uh, getting everyone on the same page portion. Um, but this month's theme is, as per my sex bio's theme of group sex, is natural selection and collective action. So get you all uh, thinking about, like, my, on my thought process of the group theme, I thought about, like, expanding group sex into the big groups of humanity. So group sex in that sense, that's how where I came to natural selection. And so in that world of biological evolution or evolutionary science, a lot of these words get colloquially thrown around of cooperation versus competition. And I'll problematize those in just a moment. But when we're talking about cooperation in that sense, we're usually talking about the gift economy that hunter-gatherers lived under, where there was no private property, right? There was no owning of land, uh, which is not to say that every single hunter-gatherer tribal nation followed that, but overall, that was the tendency. And that was something that Marx actually called primary communism. The more common translation you'll see is primitive communism. That is a translation issue. I don't like to use the word primitive. I think it is too loaded. Primary is a perfectly acceptable translation of the word that Marx used in German. So I'm going to go with primary communism. And then uh, competition, the other word that gets thrown around, often used to mean an exchange or transaction economy, or referring to the concept of social Darwinism, which to be clear is a concept that Darwin himself rejected. But those words are not how the researchers themselves would employ those terms, because they understand that in evolutionary science, there is uh, cooperation and competition. But what these words mean colloquially, I'm going to call this. So when people are talking about cooperation in the colloquial sense, they more often mean something called coompetition. And that's actually something that the evolutionary biology researchers use uh, themselves that phrase, co-competition, the idea of cooperation and competition kind of working together in different ways. And that that law of co-competition, the natural law of you may compete, but you may not wage war, which brings us to the question, what is war? And that is what I think people most often mean when they're talking about competition or like a dog-eat-dog -dog world or that social Darwinism. So competition is different from war 
war is when you deny someone the free access to the means of production. Typically in, in evolutionary science, that's, uh, that's land or food. So you can compete, you can try to get food uh, using all of the capabilities bestowed upon you, and you can be ruthless in your competing. But if you deny free access to the means of production to any individual or a whole population, at that point, you're engaging in warfare in, in, the, in the sense that we're, we're going to be using. And remember, means of production being crucial to the, what determines who has power and what kind of political economy we're in. And you can see you have uh, primary communism on the one side versus uh, social Darwinism or capitalism, imperialism on the other. Moving forward from that, just want to clarify some things. You've probably heard that humans are just bad. All we do is consume and destroy and that's the way it is. Some people take that to mean that we need to just end the human race so that the rest of the environment can flourish. Some people take that to be an excuse for, well, as long as we're bad anyway, I'm just going to enjoy myself hedonistically and not have responsibilities for others, or I'm just going to do my best to dominate others as much as I can because that's the nature of the world and I want to win it. That is a grave misconception of the history of humanity, as well as I would just call it outright anti-Indigenous racism. Why do I say that? Because the hunter-gatherer culture that Marx called primary communism, that is by far the majority of human existence on this planet. We moder anatomically modern humans have been living and are still living under uh, hunter-gatherer culture for 250,000 years, by some estimates more, and depending on how exact you want to get on anatomically modern, going back even farther, the Homo genus has been around for two to three million years, living all under primary communism, not to mention the entirety of life on Earth, right? Uh, we don't have to limit ourselves to humans, but like squirrels don't have private property. And they're, they're living in a regenerative relationship with the earth, just the way that our hunter-gatherer ancestors and the hunter-gatherer people who, yes, do still exist today, are living in a regenerative relationship with earth now. But in just a short 10,000 years uh, since the agricultural revolution, we have plunged ourselves into a collapse of the entirety of the biosphere. I don't mean that lightly. We're experiencing the sixth mass extinction of the planet's entire history. And because of the actions of one and climate change is, is happening, it's not something that's going to happen, right? We're experiencing it now. So the, the biosphere has collapsed and a number of nations on this planet have already experienced apocalypse, especially the ones, the indigenous ones on Turtle Island here in the United States, I'm thinking of. But that's not to say, right, that like, socialists don't believe in farming. That's not what I mean by the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution could have played out a number of ways, uh, but the way that it did play out was a way through imperialist expansion of a gatekeeping of who decided to control the means of production. So over here on the left, you have hunter-gatherers who, if you want uh, shelter or food, or even to some degree, healthcare and education, you had the means of production to provide that for yourself and your family and your community. And, and you had other people to help you in that, that wouldn't gatekeep it from you. They weren't demand something in return for it, right? That's the nature of the gift economy. Whereas the agricultural revolution and the particular way that it played out, uh, you have over here, you have some people who have a surplus of food, um, but that means that they don't have other things. And then that frees up other people to create other things. Here I have an example of a tool, but no food. So now you need a system of distribution and you need a system of exchange to make that work. And the particular way that that happened was a way based on the concept of private property. The agricultural revolution as it happened turned land among other things into a commodity. And when you have people who are gatekeeping food and you have a whole bunch of other people with a lack of food, then you need to hire people for security and you come up with an enforcer class 
that evolves today into the military and police and people who are enforcing that distribution of resources, that unequal distribution of resources. So that is some of the history of humanity on Earth. And I also want to take the opportunity of group thinking to go into what do we do about this? There are a lot of different answers to that and models for that. My personal favorite is something called the Movement Action Plan. And this one I highlight because there's a lot of really wonderful analysis on what can we do in the sense of like, how do I organize with my neighborhood? And how do I recruit people? And how do I do outreach, right? And that kind of thing. There is not quite as much analysis on the movement level, how, how, what trajectory do movements have and how does that work and what are the stages and what, what do we do at each stage? Whereas the movement action plan does exactly that. It looks at a movement from what it calls stage one, which is business as usual. And that's at the point where you have less than 10% of public opposition to power holder policies. That's that middle line there. And then all the way to stage eight, which is when you see the wins in question for that particular movement, where you have at least 80% public opposition to those power holder policies. And you can zoom in and out on any movement, right? So you have Black Lives Matter being one movement, um, but within Black Lives Matter, you have trying to get increased police accountability. But within the increased police accountability, you have defunding the police, demilitarizing the police, uh, you have body cams on police, you have all different kinds of, you can zoom in and out. But the main takeaways of the movement action plan are that depending on which stage you're in, there will be different roles for different activist archetypes. And for instance, one of those archetypes being the protester, right? The rebel who goes into the streets and, and makes marches and protests happen. Then you have the reformer type activist who works in official nonprofit channels or like with government to make policy change. And I emphasize those two because those two are often at odds with each other, but they can work together beautifully when they are aware of those different roles and how they can contribute to each other which will change based on where you are in in the movement uh, stage evolution. So some of the examples here, and I do have an article on it that I reference in the resources, so I'll show you that. But in that takeoff period, right, of stage four, that's where the rebel archetype really shines. Whereas in the six to seven stages, that's where the reformer works to make those that, that public energy translate into uh, policy change. So that's just one example, but there's a lot of analysis around it. So I, I really love this model. Some other things to highlight here are the concept of the trigger event. Why is this so special, right? It's important to realize that trigger events are happening all throughout here, uh, all through stages one through eight. But when the public does not major majority oppose what is happening, the trigger events at stage one won't create that takeoff period. So you have different roles then. What do you do in stage one? You document and you make clear what the problem is so that when people say, why haven't you tried talking to these people? You can say, oh, well, we did. And this is the response we got. And then you use that as more recruiting for the movement. And then once you get that public opposition happening and building up, then at some point when the next trigger event occurs, then there will be that that infrastructure there to have that takeoff to get a lot of media attention and all that. And then that will that's the energy that pushes the movement the rest of the way through. Another stage I like to emphasize is stage five, the activist failure. That I really love because there is a lot of idea during the takeoff stage of like, this is great, we're going to win, change is just around the corner. But eventually there's always a regression to the mean. That just the nature of sociology among many other sciences. And so once people see that that change isn't happening as quickly and people, the media stops paying so much attention and people kind of move to other things, there's this sense that the movement has failed or the activist organization has failed. That often happens. But knowing that that is part of the process can really help take the edge off there. And that stage is where there's a lot of infighting because people see that 
quote, the movement didn't work. And so then they fight over why and who's responsible and all those kinds of things. And just knowing that that is part of the, the natural evolution of a movement can go a long way into being people continue to work together in good faith with each other. And I didn't say this before, but this is formalized by an activist named Bill Moyer, not to be confused with the journalist Bill Moyers. They are two different people. This is from his book, Doing Democracy, which has a lot of interesting stuff. I don't actually recommend the book itself because I the the way it's written, I think I'll I'll show you the resource I do recommend for that. So moving forward then, some resources. Uh, this square here in the lower left, that's the resources around socialism versus capitalism and political economy in general. Some things to highlight. Mumbo Jumbo is a really awesome glossary from the Black Socialists of America, awesome org. And Richard Wolf is great in general. And that video is my particular favorite intro video on the subject. And then of course, sex and socialism is what we do here at My Sex Bio. And that article goes into more in depth, the relationship between all these things. And I am a big comic book fan and I do recommend Marx's Capital Illustrated for that. Capital is a multi-thousand page series of volumes that very few people are going to read, but comic books are great for that. This middle one here, uh, this gets more at the natural selection population stuff. Um, I emphasize some really awesome indigenous-led stuff here, Red Nation Oregon podcast, as well as Indigenous Anarchist Federation. And then that stop line three, speaking of collective action, that is an action happening right now. People are uh, protest camping over in Minnesota, and uh, it's it's kind of this year's standing rock. There's a there's a lot of really awesome stuff happening. I do intend to visit myself. We were supposed to go, but it didn't work out um, this this week. But um, we're looking at June right now. And then some other things on myths around the commons and overpopulation. Uh, some really good stuff there. Strongly recommend these uh, YouTube channels, Philosophy Tube and Mexi, as well as the podcast Ashes Ashes. That particular episode goes into population stuff as well. The book Ishmael is an excellent, excellent book, 250 pages or so, and a very quick read, uh, not academic at all. Um, and then this one in the lower right corner, this one is about the evolution of movements, that map of change. That is the article that, uh, that I wrote that condenses uh, and, and I think more, more relatably explains the theory that uh, Bill Moyer put forth in his book, Doing Democracy, and some really awesome resources in general. The, those two videos, Movement Cycles and How to Organize the Simpsons, are really awesome looks at, at, uh, at how movements happen. I think a lot of people don't, a lot of people have a lot of criticisms that don't realize like everything at play in, in organizing a movement and, and actions and, and various kinds. Awesome. So that is the the presentation portion of this. If you are watching this in a recording, we have some breakout questions, which include what are your ancient cultures attitudes towards sex and how has colonialism affected your sexuality? Something to think about. And then the other breakout question that you would be responding to if you were with us is what is your relationship to indigenous people in general? including your own ancestors, and especially those whose land you are on right now? And how might you deepen those relationships, um, which can include a lot of ways, including getting involved in the movements that they are in somehow, or Native justice in general. So those are the breakout questions. Thank you so much for joining us and for watching this video. Please do check us out for future future presentations, as well as the rest of what My Sex Bio offers, which is really awesome stuff. This is March's theme of natural selection and collective action. April's theme will be detoxing masculinity. Some really awesome stuff there. Do, do keep tabs on what we're up to. Thank you.